Hello everyone, uh, welcome to the week 8 uh, lecture on labor market imperfections. So, um, as I mentioned in the uh, uh, class last week, that uh, in the following weeks we are going to be talking about imperfections in various markets that would uh, facilitate uh, um, uh, 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 hampering the development process and how we could think about policies that help us individuals in developing countries overcome these market constraints um, and, 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 and uh, uh, help, help in our, 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 our prosperity which you sort of uh, uh, think about as policies trying to rectify market imperfections uh, or other imperfections that lead to uh, sort of frictions in the market uh, which uh, uh, we, can, we can overcome in the process of development. So today's paper, we, uh, we will uh, focus on, in, in today's talk, we will focus on uh, labor market imperfections and we will be talking about these imperfections primarily in the context of migration, right? So, so we will talk about the uh, role of migration in uh, the process of development for a society uh, and how labor market imperfections could uh, uh, um, potentially thwart that process uh, uh, of, of growth via migration. Um, in, in today's lecture, I will be primarily uh, focus on um, uh, migration internally within a country and on Thursday we will discuss uh, international migration as a pathway to the society. Um, so as you probably know already or have a sense that an important route out of poverty is uh, a physical movement of people, relocation of people over generations, right? So um, we know, for example, people move from urban to rural, uh, sorry, rural to urban areas uh, in search of better jobs, better opportunities, uh, uh, better quality of life. Uh, people also move out of the country. Uh, in, in large numbers and, and migrate to other countries for the sort of same kind of motivations, right? So, so uh, uh, overall, the migration has been an integral process to, to development both sort of uh, individual cross economic prosperity as well as societal economic prosperity, right? Various communities have uh, over the generations have moved to uh, various physical locations in search of uh, uh, sort of better. Occupations and better prospects. Okay, so for example, we know uh, that there are a lot of uh, uh, migrants from Bengal that uh, that go to uh, 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 Gujarat uh, for uh, to work in the diamond industry, right? So, so, so they have sort of you know, in, in large numbers and moved to, to Gujarat for uh, because they find employment there. Uh, various uh, Gujarati uh, diamond merchants are now uh, located in, in Antwerp in, in, in Europe where um, uh, which is always the center of the diamond market right so so uh, uh, and now they are sort of overtaking the other uh, traditional big diamond uh, firms and and the, the, the Gujarati diamond firms are the, the, the they are sort of currently do the Antwerp uh, diamond so, so and, and that was possible because large number of merchants at one point uh, moved and settled in that world. Right? So, so these kinds of movements, uh, both within country as well as in this, uh, internationally, we see lead to uh, uh, large changes in the economic lives of the people who do. And we want to understand uh, uh, how sort of that plays out uh, in a specific context. Uh, and, and to what extent that matters for economic prosperity for those individuals relative to those who sort of stayed back. Um, um, so, um, so uh, as, as you sort of uh, 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 have a sense uh, 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 already from these examples of, of the diamond, mar uh, diamond market in India and internationally, that economic and social upward mobility is related to physical mobility, right? So, so these two are interesting move physically to sort of climb up the social uh, economic hierarchy. Um, 
and and a key aspect within this concept of migration as a pathway to development is uh, migration from rural to urban area. In fact, that's how the initial uh, theories of uh, migration uh, or economic development was conceptualized. So, economic development was initially conceptualized uh, as a as a process of of people moving from rural to urban areas, as encapsulated in the uh, Lewis model. So this is a sort of famous Lewis model uh, based on this paper in 1954, where he's uh, uh, giving us a, a model of, of uh, uh, development for an, for an underdeveloped society. And, and his view is that, you know, uh, uh, is to sort of think about the economy being sort of primarily divided into two sectors. One is sort of a large rural agricultural sector, um, right? And, and there is an urban sector where uh, which is sort of rather small, where people are primarily engaged in uh, a manufacturing, uh, industrial or specifically manufacturing activity, right? So, so you can think about the economy being divided into uh, a, a agricultural and, and, and industrial or manufacturing sectors, and the agricultural sector is primarily in rural, where, where bulk of the population lives, and and, and with a small population uh, uh, working in the manufacturing. Now. This results in um, uh, the urban rural wage gap, right? So, so the wages that people, most of the people are earning against their labor, uh, these wages systematically are different in these two sectors, even though they, they are in, in the same country. And, and that's what motivates my rural urban migration. Uh, why, what is the idea behind this rural urban uh, wage gap? So the idea is that, uh, say, if you want to write down a model where uh, wage equals the marginal product of labor, right? So this is sort of suppose in R means the rural. So so wage in the rural area in equilibrium will be the derivative of the production function in the rural area with respect to labor. So, so maybe I should have written L rather than a prime. Uh, but anyways, think of uh, if R prime as the derivative of F R with respect to L R, right? So so this is the marginal product of labor. Um, uh, in, in the rural area, so the rural area is primarily doing agriculture, so so its production technology is captures that, uh, and and the, uh, so so that sort of uh, uh, so it depends on the on the capital or the machinery used in agriculture and the total volume of labor that goes into agriculture. Okay, so that determines uh, so, so the marginal product at, evaluated at that level of capital and labor in the rural area determines the rural way to get. Uh, and uh, urban areas are sort of decently located uh, which depends on the, the capital and machinery used in the in the urban manufacturing sector and the labor present in the manufacturing sector uh, and which and, and and this is the FU is the uh, uh, the manufacturing production technology and if you prime is the derivative of FU with respect to LU Right, so so is the marginal product of labor in the manufacturing sector, and that's uh, that would equal the wage rate of the uh, of the manufacturing sector. So so people employed in the manufacturing sector get a wage rate W, which equals their marginal product, which depends on the capital and labor employed there, and uh, and uh, WR depends on the capital and labor employed there and the, the production technology, which determines the marginal. Right? And and the, the point is that there is a gap between WR and WU. Specifically, WU uh, is is systematically higher than WR. Why why is that? This is because of two reasons. Uh, one is um, that uh, the production technology in in urban area is is much more productive than the AFR. So basically, the idea is that the the, the manufacturing sector has a much higher marginal product of labor conditional on the same level of capital unemployed across the two sectors uh, than the uh, uh, agricultural sector. And the idea being that, uh, you know, manufacturing sector uses modern technology which inherently enhances productivity of labor, right? So, so uh, we are thinking about, you know, Lewis is writing down this model in 1954 where most of the developing countries, agriculture was primarily sort of in a small agriculture, in small landholding, etc. It's not capital intensive work, it doesn't use so much technology. 
uh, uh, so so the marginal product of labor is, is not very high in rural sector as opposed to in the manufacturing sector where uh, plants use relatively modern machinery so, so you know these also think about this process of modernity uh, as as also sort of playing in the background in in, in, the, in these model of economic development uh, so 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 that sort of shapes the these marginal products moreover apart from the marginal products the capital labor ratios are also very different so so most of the people are are uh, are living in in rural areas which uses minimal capital so so the capital labor ratio is significantly lower in rural areas as opposed to urban areas and we know that yeah, for higher capital labor ratio uh, you know in, in any sort of standard production technology where capital labor are are, are complements uh, um, we will get that the marginal product will be higher even for the same production function right so even if you fix a production function and increase the capital labor ratio uh, then it will increase the marginal product of labor for a, for any sort of standard production technology which which where the the, the, the two actors complements I meaning if you if you, have, you, know, you cannot produce uh, with just capital or with just labor yeah. so in so in such production functions you will, you will have the case um, I will have this case. So, so now, so then there are two reasons why the wage rate in the urban sector will be higher than the rural sector. Uh, both because the production technology is is more productive, the technology is better, so it has a sort of better total factor of productivity, so to speak, in urban area. And also, conditional on, on, on the technology, the capital labor ratio is much higher in urban area. So, for, for both reasons, wage rate in, in urban area uh, remains high in rural area to begin with. Okay. Now uh, Luis's second point was that you know this this should motivate migration. Rural urban at some point people will realize that you know they're yeah, that they're, they're stuck in agriculture, too many people are stuck in agriculture, they should start moving to the cities to sort of join the workforce. Um, but uh, any sort of movement, initial movement migration Towards the urban area wouldn't immediately lead to uh, sort of you know the, the wages being equalized. Why that's the case? His point is that that's because there is disguised unemployment in the agricultural or the rural area, uh, meaning that there are a lot of people working in agriculture whose marginal product is effectively zero. So they you know just because there is not much opportunity in, you know, around. They are sort of stuck in agriculture. They are doing some labor, but if you kind of remove them, it's not that the production will fall. The, the level output will fall. So their marginal product is effectively zero. So you know they are sort of helping out at the on the sidelines, but but they are not essential for for the for the production of the output. So there is a lot of what he calls disguised unemployment. Okay. And and so when people start moving out. This disguised unemployment, because of the presence of disguised unemployment, you will not uh, get that the cap even though the capital labor ratio is changing a little, uh, in a little bit, it's, it's going up in the rural area. You will not see that the rural areas wage rise immediately. Okay, because now you know if if it were to be the case that the rural area had a it's very standard like a cobbler's kind of production technology, then any fall in in the in the labor due to migration would lead to an increase in the in the wage rate in the rural area, but but because of the presence of the disguised unemployment, uh, when migration starts, we do not see immediate rise in in the uh, rural area. But urban areas production technology is more standard, so there is no disguised unemployment there. So there, as migration starts. Uh, um, you will see that uh, the, the urban wages fall a little bit, right? So, so we will see declining urban wages uh, uh, as as migration continues, but but the rural wages stay relatively same, same, unless a substantial part of the population sort of moves to the urban area. So that's the process of urbanization. People moving and settling down in urban areas, they're finding new opportunities, etc. Uh, uh, of course, you know during that time the urban manufacturing sector itself may, may undergo change. There will be new industries coming up to absorb this labor, etc. Uh, but in any case, eventually you will see uh, beyond the point uh, the the rural wages going up, and and uh, in long run equilibrium they will sort of equalize. Okay. 
Um, so that's that's the sort of idea uh, of of development. That it, it's a, it's a process of of migration to, to to places of prosperity in urban locations where all the sort of modern sort of jobs, modern manufacturing or industrial jobs are available, and and uh, uh, that sort of leads to. Uh, equalization of rural urban wage gap and, and absorption of the disguised and disguised unemployed individuals into more productive employment. Um, so, so that's sort of Luis's model. Uh, there is another model uh, uh, Harris, uh, by Harris and Kodaro that they proposed in 1970, uh, where they say that actual wage gap may actually persist in the long run if if finding a job is uncertain in the urban area. So, so Meaning that it's not uh, uh, always, it need not be always true that the moment you land up in the urban sector, urban area, you will find up with a productive employment. Um, even though even though labor is relatively scarce in urban area, it still could be the case that there is there is positive unemployment rate even in the urban area that people are not able to find find the right kind of job, and so 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 even though they are living in urban area, there there is likelihood that they might be unemployed. So, so then migration may involve uncertainty, right? And that's an important contribution by Harris and Kodaro that that there is there is risk involved in, in, in migration um, uh, for a lot of people. It's not guaranteed that you will find a job, and therefore what you will sort of equate is the rural wage that you are getting, uh, uh, and and so in, in long run equilibrium, what will be equated is not the rural wage rate and the urban wage rate. But the rural wage rate and the expected urban wage rate. So, so with certain probability, so suppose you have this sense that there is some risk of, of going to urban area, meaning that in case I migrate, there is some probability P in which with which I'll find a job, in which case I'll get WU. But with probability one minus P, e, I will not find a job, in which case I'll get uh, in a very little uh, uh, wage, so you know, something close to zero. So I'll, I'll not be able to earn, right? So so. What we will equate is not WU and WR in the long run, but you equate w, uh, WR and P times W, which is the expected uh, way urban wage, right? And and if you equate that, then you will get that since P is less than one, uh, w, WU <coughs> will always be bigger than w, WR, so that P times WU becomes equal to W. So, so the idea is that in presence of uncertainty due to un positive unemployment rate in the urban area, um, uh, migration may not equalize uh, actual wages. It will equalize expected wage in urban area. Uh, we are, we are going to do that. Okay. So that's that's the sort of contribution I have to 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 say that uncertainty is important. And 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 if if uncertainty is important. Uh, you, you may not in, in in the real data you may not see equalization, <coughs> which is what you kind of see. But the point is that there might be uh, uh, other reason why the rural urban wage gap uh, um, uh, does not. Uh, so so now the point is that if if there is sort of you know uh, 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 if the, the the rural urban wage gap sustains in the long run. Uh, it will continue to have uh, 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 generate migration, right? And and there are reasons to believe that there are uh, several barriers to migrate uh, beyond the sort of expected wage idea. So so currently in in the in the in the uh, 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 field of research field on migration, people understand that uh, the there there could be other barriers to migration over and above. Uh, uh, concerns about wages, right? So, so in in the view of the initial theorizers of economic development uh, by Lewis and Harris and Kutaro, uh, what what the, the only motivating factor for migration was sort of this rural urban wage gap, and and now people sort of highlight that there might be other frictions, right? So, and that sort of is the is the friction that, that we should think about. So, so uh, there are several papers that highlight several. Uh, aspects of this. So one could be that there are social networks that facilitate finding jobs and if you are not part of those networks it would be really rather hard to find uh, employment in professions uh, 
that you that you were seeking uh, once you move to, to the urban area. So, for example, there are in the Indian context there are strong caste networks, right? So, so all these uh, uh, Bengalis uh, who are moving to Gujarat to work in the diamond industry, they 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 would come tend to come from sort of some uh, specific caste groups, right? So, so if you belong to that caste group, they, then you will know people who would know people who have migrated. So, sort of we can. Uh, find out the details of, of how to migrate, where where to go, how to find these uh, these kinds of jobs in in the in the rural uh, sorry in the in the uh, uh, diamond industry in Gujarat. You know they, there could be referrals happening on your behalf, etc. All this can happen if you're socially connected to the right network to have these kinds of jobs, right? Uh, um, so so. If you are not part of these caste networks, you will, you will not. It will be harder for you uh, to get uh, specific sort of uh, employment, which can uh, 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 sort of reduce your probability of, of finding a job. So, so, so it will make you harder for you to move. So that's sort of one. And these kinds of networks is sort of prevalent. You know, there could be ethnic networks in, in other contexts as well. In the context of China, for example. Uh, people find that the, the right network is, is is a physical coming the village that you came from so so a lot of people migrate to the urban area from various parts of the country in china where, where rural urban migration is, is quite high uh, and and there what matters is whether you and uh, you and, and and the person who will help you find a job are from the same village because if you are from the same area then uh, then that sort of is the is the right network that that facilitates all these kinds of benefits uh, of, of, of of finding a job. So so again, uh, you you will be able to set up a business or you will be able to find a good employer employment uh, if if you if you know somebody from from the same village. So so that seems to be you know the your your birth uh, village seems to be the the, the primary social network. Uh, is the is the dimension along which networks are organized, social networks are organized. Um, apart from networks, there could be sort of associated aspect could be information asymmetry. So, so you may not be uh, aware about all the job opportunities that are available in urban areas, which could also help to uh, reduce migration. And and there could also be the idea of risk aversion, which is what you know motivated by by the Harry Sanford model. So. Uh, so, if you are risk averse, uh, you know that uh, uh, migration entails risk, and this is especially true for people who are uh, particularly poor and living around the subsistence uh, uh, region, because they, if they face a risk of not finding an employment, then they fear, face a risk of starvation, right? Because they're already at a subsistence level, and so, so, uh, so for them. Uh, migration is really risky because they have to risk starvation, right? So in case they, you know, they have to entertain the prospect that they they don't they don't find an employment and, and don't find any work, uh, and that that would be a dire consequence. So 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 that might uh, uh, be a, an important barrier for these people, to right? Because in, in in rural areas they they live in a community they can. Uh, you know, they also face uh, risk in terms of you know uh, variation, variation in weather, which can affect agricultural output and, and wages. But at least they can rely on, on their local networks uh, around the village to, to help them out in case of need. Uh, um, but but once they move to the urban area, that's sort of a much more uh, uh, riskier undertaking, right? So 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 for them. So, so various these factors, so social and caste net or caste networks, in, in the case of India, ethnic networks, in the case of many other countries, uh, location-based networks in the context of, of China, uh, along with information asymmetry and, and risk aversion, especially for for the poor, uh, act as multiple barriers to migration. So even if uh, there are sort of these large rural urban wage gaps. Uh, it can still uh, need not imply large migration from rural to urban area because of these kinds of barriers, right? And and these are these so they basically that means that there is there is uh, 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 um, money to be made which is not being made because because of these sort of various kinds of barriers that that exist in society. And 
and and removal of these barriers can can lead to uh, um, greater greater migration and economic prosperity consequently. Okay. So so this is for example is a is the is a is, is a figure for India. So so the the, the solid line is the real uh, rural wage, and the, the dotted line is the real urban wage. You see first that the urban wage is systematically higher than the rural wage even after. Uh, uh, controlling for you know, uh, price differences across the two areas. So, so even in sort of PPP terms, there is a wage difference, and the wage difference remains systematically stable for a long time. So, you know, starting from 1980s to till about end of uh, 1990s, we, we see that uh, uh, the rural urban wage have remained stable. After which, urban gap, uh, urban wages seems to have uh, uh, fallen a little bit in real terms. Uh, but still, this continue to be, to be a, a substantial wage gap, right? Uh, uh, even even till the uh, late 2000s. So, so it is not the case that you know, uh, even after so many years, you would have thought that Lewis's model would predict that you know these these uh, urban rural wages would have equalized, and 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 uh, uh, modern research shows that you know there are all these kinds of barriers. Uh, that that sort of uh, 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 withstands that kind of a force you know, uh, of market force to equalize the world. So, so you should, should think about these kinds of barriers most of this. Um, so. Uh, I'll, I'll talk about this this process of migration and, and, and upward economic mobility in the context of this paper uh, by Beagle, DeWitt, and Durkheim in 2011. It's called Migration and Economic Mobility in Tanzania. So what they basically do is they, they go to a region in Tanzania and, and they uh, try to see whether migration leads to uh, better economic prospects for those people who have moved out versus those people who have stayed in. Right? So, so basically, the research question is: uh, Does physical movement out of original community lead to economic prosperity? Right? Uh, what they're going to do is use a panel data um, uh, from from a, a region called Kagera in, in Tanzania. So, so the, the 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 first round of the panel data. So, it was not sort of you know. The, the initial round of the data was not collected with the intention of, of collecting a panel data. So the initial round was carried out in, in 1991 via, through 1994 uh, uh, with the help of the World Bank and a local university in Tanzania. Um, and the, the primary objective of that in baseline survey was to, was a, it was a health survey trying to see uh, the, the, the spread of the AIDS epidemic. Um, and now these researchers were interested in migration, so they basically use these uh, the, the the survey uh, households and go and track them in 2004, right? So so uh, uh, in order to understand how many of them have moved and and, and, and then see whether what happened to their lives is that those those who stayed back, right? Now they are they are going back after about 10 to 13 years. Uh, uh, to these to these areas, so so tracking individuals after such a long time is, is, is going to be especially hard, given that the baseline survey was not done with that purpose, right? So so now what they basically do is that you know their their main effort goes in tracking individuals who who have moved, um, and they they recognize that it's going to be an important part of the of the exercise because why? Because if if it's harder to find people who who have moved, uh, then relative to people who have stayed back, uh, then if you don't put a really hard effort, notable effort, uh, to to track the people who migrated, then in the in the follow up sample, you will have uh, uh, you know attrition from the sample, meaning that there will be people who will not be able to track. Uh, uh, and those people will be systematically uh, be migrants, more likely to be migrants than, than non-migrants, right? So, so, so then your sample that you 
that you have uh, panel data on uh, will be systematically different, right? So, so you will, you will systematically lose out the migrants, especially those who have moved to farther places, let's say, uh, than than those who have stayed back. So, so then it would be it would be hard to do a, a test of whether migration matters for economic development because we be systematically underestimating the effect of migration because you'll be leaving out a lot of those migrants who move to far off places. Probably, you know, they're uh, earning a lot higher wages or returns on their migration uh, than the people who have been able to track. And so, so, so that's, that's an important concern in this study, right? Uh, but what they do is they know they 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 have been very successful in in tracking down the individuals who moved. So basically, they have, they they were able to track down ninety three percent of the of the uh, uh, households uh, that that were initially interviewed in, in early nineteen nineties. Okay? So that's that's pretty good, and, and they show that these the the the, the differences in in the, the original sample and, and the sample that they have been able to track is 93 percent. Uh, they are very similar to the other characteristics. Um, even though it is still the case that among even among the seven percent that they have not been able to track, there is some you know there there is a little bit of over representation of migrants, but but it's not so significant that we will severely underestimate. Uh, the, the effect of migration on, on uh, standard of living. Um, if you look at the sort of raw data, uh, what they find is that consumption growth of those who migrated out of the Kagera, which is basically out of a particular region. So Kagera is a region, it's like a state, so to speak. Um, so, so if you only compare the people who migrated out of Kagera, not everybody migrated out of the entire region, but but if you just look at those people who did, uh, with those people who, who stayed back uh, in their own community, um, the consumption growth of, of the migrants, uh, out migrants, are 10 times larger than those who didn't move. So, so you know, there are large differences. The question is to what extent it's, it's driven by um, the fact that uh, they move to different occupation when they move uh, out of out of the region, and and that's what's driving the return. So maybe it's it's not the fact that you migrated, but because you changed occupation, right? So so and that's what's driving the the, the consumption growth. Uh, and the other concern is to what extent it's driven by. Individual heterogeneity, meaning that the people who out migrate are systematically different from people who, who migrate, uh, who don't migrate. Uh, maybe because the people who migrated, they are already rich to begin with. You know, they didn't have financial constraints, uh, so so it was easier for them to migrate. They didn't have to think about starvation, etc. Um, and and so so even if they had stayed back, their in, their income would have grown, or the consumption would have grown. Uh, um, by by a significant portion anyway. So so are the people who have stayed back the right set of counterfactuals for the people who have moved out, right? So so that's what sort of goes uh, goes at the heart of establishing the causal effect of migration. So maybe it's not the fact that the the migration is is driving this consumption growth, but it's it's the fact that the individuals are different. They come from very different families, you know, who have very different outlook. And uh, we have very different wealth levels, uh, um, and, and and that's what drives that's what drives uh, uh, consumption growth, and, and not the fact that you know, and, and not, not migration per se. So so this sort of uh, so the question is 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 this large gap that the authors see in the raw data is it because of migration or is it because of this individual level? So that's that's the question. But before that, a little bit of context. So, so this is uh, Kagera. So, Kagera is a northern uh, region uh, in in this country, Tanzania, which is sort of on the east of Africa, um, and and this is uh, bordering uh, Burundi, Rwanda, and, and Uganda. So, this is Uganda, and this is Lake Victoria, which is a large lake divided across from the two countries, Rwanda and Tanzania. 
so 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 tokenizer is a sort of uh, bordering uh, it's it's a border region um, um a little bit of economic context so uh, if you look at the in, think about the entire country uh, between 1994 and 2004 as the authors report uh, tanzania experienced a period of relatively rapid economic growth about 4.2 percent per annum uh, population grew less than that population grew about 3.2 percent per annum so so this sort of that shows uh, that per capita uh, so this is this is real uh, this is real income growth uh, and so so per capita real income growth was, was about one percent um, and and there were a lot of sort of liberalizing policies, uh, trade orientation, stable political context, etc. That that sort of uh, people think contributed to, to this relatively rapid growth. But even though there was rapid growth, it was not broad based. So so poverty reduction uh, was was relatively minimal during that time. Uh, so so poverty fell from thirty nine percent to thirty six percent only during this ten year period. And most of the poverty reduction was concentrated in the capital city or in the urban areas, basically that is Salam, so it is the capital, where the poverty fell from 28 to 18 percent, so that's a large fall, uh, uh, but but in rural Tanzania there was hardly any change, right? so, 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 so the rural Tanzania didn't benefit from uh, a, a lot from, from this uh, growth prospect, so growth was primarily urban, uh, potentially manufacturing or, or industrial sector growth. And, and the question is, is, is migration going to be then play an important role in, in, in uh, changing the lives of people? Okay. Uh, given the fact that the rural, the rural area is not experiencing a lot of growth. And, and they chose Kagera for, for one reason that, you know, it, it's, uh, uh, it's, uh, uh, it's sort of overall economic trends mimic the, the national trend. So, so Kagera is, is uh, also Kagera is mostly rural and agricultural. Uh, so, so that helps <coughs> to, to to see you know, how many of them have migrated, etc. Um, and and their primary uh, crops are you know um, banana and coffee in the northern part of the region, and and various rain-fed uh, uh, crops such as uh, maize, sorghum, and cotton in the south. Um, and um, they also experience, uh, you know, similar kind of growth rates, about four percent per annum growth rate uh, in in, in Kagera, uh, but poverty reduction again was very minimal. So, so this primarily agricultural region remained relatively poor even during this ten year period. Okay. So that sort of motivates uh, why one should look at migration. Oops, sorry. So, so here is the, the uh, sort of summary of, of the data. So originally the, the World Bank survey in 1990s uh, surveyed about 900 odd uh, households and uh, they were not able to trace 63 of them okay? and 17 of them are deceased. So if you leave out the, the 17 deceased, so deceased meaning that all the family members in, in those households are deceased. Right, so so they're trying to track uh, the the family members of the original households. So there, there is more people than, of course, 900. Uh, so these 17 households have about 27 individuals, all of whom are deceased. So they, of course, they 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 are, they are not part of the sample. Of the people who are alive in 2004, they are only able to track. They they are able to only not able to track uh, seven percent. So that's that's this. Of the 830 few households uh, 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 um, that they're able to track, they they now you know of course during this 10, 10 year period the household formations have changed. So they're they're uh, uh, surveying all new households, which includes a member uh, who are part of the original household, right? So that's that's their study. So so they're tracking all the individuals. From the original households, and and which it, and they may be uh, forming new households by now, and but but they'll track all the individuals who were part of the original survey, and they'll 
they will look at the, the household data of all those individuals, uh, you know, the, the new household data of all those individuals are part of the business. Okay. So there are about 2700 new households. So this is a lot of you know, new households getting formed because people are moving, they are getting married and setting up new families. So, so, so that's why the number of new households is substantially larger relative to the, the original households. Okay. Uh, of these 2700 new households, who can be sort of tracked back to their original households. Um, about half of them stay in the same village. So, so only about half move. So it's about 50%. That's a substantial migration, you know, 50% move. But uh, of the 50%, 20, about 20 move to a nearby village. Okay. Another 20 move to a village uh, uh, in the same region, but not in the original, but not uh, near the original. So they, they sort of move to a uh, relatively far away okay, yeah, within the region and about 10% move out. So, so 10% uh, 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 move out of the region but live in Tanzania, there's 2% of household that sort of leave Tanzania and go to Uganda. So basically 50% uh, don't move and of the 50, it's diverse, you know, 40% stay within the region, 10% uh, move out of the region. And there is variation even among the people who move out of the, move out of the region in terms of where they settle. So even though uh, a, a quarter of them settle in, in the capital Dar es Salaam, there is substantial variation. So uh, Mwanza is the neighboring region. So if I can go back to the map. So, so Mwanza is the neighboring region. Here. So, a lot of them move to the neighboring region, um, but a, a good part moves to the capital and to other regions. So, so that's the sort of movement. If you look at the people who uh, who got re-interviewed, um, about 63% of them live in the same community, 14%, uh, 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 so this is based on the, uh, the interviewed uh, individuals, not households. So about 63% of the, of the individuals live in the same community. 14% of the individuals live in nearby community, another 14% live in Kavira, so sort of they're equally uh, divided, and and uh, about 8%, 8.5% live outside the region. Okay. So that's sort of is the division. Uh, and um, among the people that they were not able to trace, they, they, uh, they sort of were able to determine where they have moved. And it's sort of uh, you know, uh, similar, so so uh, uh, it's about six, fifty-six percent uh, uh, stayed in the in Kagera, and, and and the rest moved, moved outside. So it's it's still it, it is it is still the case that the people who stayed inside Kagera of the people who are untrusted is, is smaller compared to the people that they interviewed. So of the people that they interviewed, a substantial person. Uh, 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 stay inside Kagera, so so you know, so basically 63 plus 28. So that's a, you know, a, a lot of the people are staying inside Kagera, but of the people who are not, they are not able to trace. Only 56 percent are, are living inside Kagera. So so it is still the case that uh, they are systematically not able to uh, trace people who have moved outside Kagera. Uh, and and uh, but but this this extent of this gap is, is relatively smaller. Okay, so that's that thing because they have been able to capture most of the households, original households. Okay, so, so this is trying to motivate the fact that migration, these sort of returns to migration. Uh, so what this is plotting is the consumption. So these are consumption per capita uh, in the new households. And it's it's plotting its distribution for 
two groups of people, so for various groups of people. So suppose you only focus of people who stayed within the community. So that's about 2,400 uh, individuals. Okay. Uh, of these 2,400 individuals, uh, in in their new household, what is the per capita uh, consumption? Uh, if you plot them now versus if you had plotted them uh, in, in 1991 and you see that uh, the, the dotted line is slightly to the right of the uh, uh, solid line which tells you that there is consumption growth so meaning that the consumption distribution has moved to the right uh, that's why that the, the, the CDF is has, has uh, moved to the right meaning that so there is now greater number of people with higher consumption which is sort of understandable there is sort of some consumption growth happening everywhere but but this is sort of a relatively small change and if you so this vertical line is the poverty line official poverty line so if you look at the the so the the area below the sorry the 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 the, the, uh, the y value at this vertical line gives you the, the people living below uh, 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 proportion of people living below poverty line so that's that's about 40 percent uh, in 91 and just only slightly below 40 percent in in uh, 2004 so so if you look at poverty reduction there is not much poverty reduction happening during this time period for the people who have stayed within the community for the people who have moved to a near community nearby village you do see some some fall there you know their 1991 is relatively similar looking as the 1991 distribution of those who stayed within the community but their 2004 is even more to the right and so poverty reduction is is bit more uh, for the people who have moved uh, farther from their community but stayed within the region uh, there again the poverty rate was 40 percent in uh, in 91 but for them the 2004 is is even more to the right so so now uh, poverty rate is is a bit more than 20 percent uh so you know 25 percent or so uh for the people who have moved but but stayed within the kagera region for the number 200 people who have moved outside kagera for them again their their original uh, 1991 distribution of consumption was relatively similar uh, so, so there was still the fact that a bit less than 40 percent so say about 35 or so percent people live were living below the poverty line in, uh, for the you know uh, in 1991 but now if you look at their 2004 uh, distribution it's, it's substantially to the right which means that the poverty rate has fallen to uh, in about 10 percent or so 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 the the rate of fall in in Poverty is substantially larger for the you know, largest for the group that moved outside Kagera, uh, followed by the people who, who uh, moved out but but lived within Kagera, and followed by the people who moved but only to the to the nearby village, and and the, for the people who stayed back, the fall was very marginal. So so you see this sort of very nice ranking uh, in terms of uh, 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 poverty reduction. Uh, or consumption growth uh, 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 as a function of, of movement and, and also this is saying that you know distance moved matters that if you move farther distance you, you, you are systematically experiencing higher consumption growth So panel three is uh, sorry, uh, figure three is comparing the distribution of, of a different part. So basically, it is showing the distribution of consumption for uh, uh, 1991 distribution for the set of people who have stayed back in village, and the same 1991 distribu consumption distribution for people who later in 2004 moved to a nearby village. So it's comparing two groups of people: those who stayed back versus those who moved to the nearby village. And it's it's comparing their 1991 distributions with each other, and they are saying that they are very similar looking. So it's sort of basically it's comparing this solid line, which is the 1991 of for people who, who stayed within village, and this solid line, which is the 1991 consumption 
for the people who move to the nearby village. So it's comparing this solid with this solid in a same graph. So so they look very similar, as I was also saying. So 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 basically, the people who move to the nearby village, they they are very similar looking on average uh, compared to the people who stayed back in the village. Okay. Um, but if you look at their 2004 outcomes, their 2004 outcomes are a bit more different. So especially at the at the bottom end of the of the distribution. So at the bottom end, they are virtually identical in 1991. So the set of people who, uh, the proportion of people who are poor among the those who stayed, those who went on to stay in the same village versus those who sort of moved to nearby village in 2004, their 1991 poverty rates are identical. They are all kind of 40%. But um, by 2004, a poverty rate uh, for the people who stayed back in the village fell to something about 30 or 35. And for the people who moved to the nearby village was, was you know, something about 25. So there is already a difference uh, even for people who move to the nearby village, okay? even though their their original income distribution so, so very similar. So this basically is saying is that it's not the case that systematically really rich people are moving, especially if you compare you know, this nearby village versus uh, uh, same village. So the nearby village mover at least are very similar looking than compared to the people who stayed back. Um, but they, for them, even migration has a has a different. So, so it cannot be the case that you know these people are richer, so, so they are able to move. There are sort of other factors. Um, if you compare the 1991 consumption distribution of people who stayed back in the village village versus to people who moved to to in uh, to farther uh, away, but within the region of Kagera. Even their 1991 distributions are very similar. You know, they are also identical. But even for them, if you look, what happened to to them in 2004? There is, you see, you know, there is a, uh, a gap. So, so poverty reduction was faster. So, even though both poverty rates are 40 percent, uh, poverty reduction was was greater for for people who uh, moved to elsewhere. So, so whether you move to a nearby village or somewhere else to in, in Kagera, uh, they, they in 1991, they are very similar looking to the people who stayed back. But poverty reduction is, is much larger by 2004 among the members. Okay, so, so that gives them confidence that, you know, there is something going on with respect to just the fact that they moved uh, uh, led, to, led to this. So this is, uh, you know, reporting the mean consumption growth for various groups. So, you know, that sort of this distribution give us a sense of the bottom tail. So, so we could talk about poverty reduction, but we also think in terms of what happens to the mean and median consumption growth. Right? Uh, um, sort of to give you the idea, average what is happening to the average, and and as those figures show, there is movement on the average as well. It's not only the tail that is. Uh, uh, experiencing larger income growth, but it is the sort of entire distribution. So, so, so if you look at the average consumption, mean consumption growth for the people who did not move, it's thirteen percent. For the people who moved out of the community, it's fifty-three percent. Of them, people who moved to a, 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 a more remote area, meaning that you know they basically probably moved to uh, uh, some some place nearby. Uh, so that's 28 percent who moved to a similar area so so more remote area than than the area that they were living in so for them even for them the the consumption growth is is larger than the non movers so it's 28 percent for the people who moved to a similar area as their original community the consumption growth is even higher 46 percent and those who move to sort of a more urban area which is, which is sort of less remote so to speak you know the consumption growth is substantial it's 90 percent Uh, and and this table is trying to say that it's, it's not the sectors or the occupations that they choose that's what's driving the results. It's something about uh, uh, the the act of movement that's resulting in this group. Uh, they sort of better jobs even within sectors. They sort of more productive uh, uh, jobs even within sectors in 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 in, in more urban areas. 
so or or in 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 areas where they move to. Uh, so if you look at the, the the if you look at the people even after the moving they so so if they come they are not comparing people uh, 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 you know those who stayed in community with those who moved out of the community uh, and they're again cutting uh, along another dimension which is whether they stay in agriculture whether they move out of agriculture into non agriculture whether they were initially non agriculture in 90 uh, in 1990s and stay in non agriculture and they sort of the last small group which is who were in non agriculture in 1990s but have moved to agriculture now and they're looking at the consumption growth of those three categories for the for the those who moved versus those who stayed back and you see within each category the the those who moved uh, experience higher growth rate. even for those those who stayed in agriculture the consumption meal consumption growth is is uh, uh, larger than the uh, the mean consumption growth uh, of the people who stayed back. Even for the people who moved out of agriculture, uh, but you have stayed back in the same community, consumption growth is larger than if you have stayed in agriculture. So it's 40 40 percent as opposed to 80 percent. But if you have moved out, then then it is one you know more than 100 percent. So it's, it's doubles more than doubles uh, the, the mean consumption uh, more than doubles. Um, and for the people who do the other way around, for the people who move from non-agriculture to agriculture, their consumption is actually negative. So, so yeah, and and they, they don't experience, the, and the movers don't experience any, any foreign consumption. Uh, you know, it's not clear why they would do that. Uh, then there could be other circumstances sort of uh, that's forcing people to, to move out of non-agriculture into agriculture. Maybe you know, there's some, some family accident, etc. What have you? But it's a very sm relatively small sample. So these two are the main samples. Even and in, in each of these samples, we find that even within sector, you know, movement has returned. Okay, so it's it's not the case that most people are moving as they are moving out of community. They are moving uh, even you know their prim primarily their their income growth is driven by movement from agriculture to non. -agriculture. Even if they stay back in agriculture, they, they experience consumption, greater consumption growth from migration. Okay. So so uh, so so you do see return to migration, and 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 it's it's present across across all kinds of uh, uh, movements across occupations. So now it is still could be the case that you know of course you know it's, it's not the occupation that is shaping the it is not the occupation that is shaping the return to migration. There is something about the act of migration that is helping them earn um, better you know better income. Uh, the question is: Is it still the case that it's the individual heterogeneity that is important? It's still the case that it's sort of the motivated people uh, 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 who who would have earned high income even if they had stayed, but it's just that. That's what's being captured by, by this migration. Okay. Uh, for that, what they're going to do is, you know, they're going to compare the same individuals over time by putting individual fixed effects, as also they're going to compare individuals within the same original households. So the original households, they know people, maybe people are siblings, one of them moved out, one of them stayed in. And um, and that who moves out first of all this comparison uh, cancels out a lot of these factors that that could be an explanation for example household level wealth or household level information maybe those households are connected and uh, uh, to, to to people who have money and and even if those the, the movers would have stayed back they would have uh, uh, you know uh, uh, they would have experienced higher consumption growth just because they are connected to you know. Uh, the right set of people. Uh, so, so all these all these sort of concerns will be cancelled out if you if you compare people within the who are living within the same household original household, but now sort of you know, form different households. And one of them moved, and one of them didn't. Right. So, so, so that's that is going to be the comparison. So we will put household fixed effects and compare individuals uh, uh, within households, uh, and and check whether the migration. Uh, of a uh, migration status of an uh, uh, individual uh, uh, 
affects the the consumption growth so so what is this uh, dependent variable dependent variable is the difference in log consumption in 2004 minus log consumption in in, um, in 1990s uh, in the baseline survey and so the difference give us the growth rate so so the difference in logs is the difference in growth rate uh, approximately um, so so uh, Basically, what this allows us to do, it's, it's, it's you are checking the, the growth in my uh, consumption as a function of whether you migrate or not, and a whole host of individual specific factors, and, and you put household fixed effects. Okay. So you put a household fixed effect, meaning that you are comparing individuals within households. So all household specific differences have been uh, uh, cancelled out. Okay. So that's what they say. And they're going to put a lot of various controls uh, here as well, uh, individual level controls here as well, and see whether even in spite of that whether migration matters or not. And this is sort of is the is the regression. Uh, it is showing that even after controlling for a whole host of uh, uh, factors and individual uh, original household fixed effect, you see that uh, whether you move out of the of the community. Has a substantial effect on the consumption. So, so if you move out, your consumption changes by increases by thirty six percent more compared to uh, your your other household members living in the same household in nineteen nineties. Uh, even after you control for a host of factors, even if you including education. So, education of course affects the consumption. You know, better educated people. Uh, uh, are, are better off, uh, but even if you compare two individuals with equal consum uh, equal level of income, uh, sorry, equal level of education, and 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 uh, uh, and other characteristics, you see that uh, you see that their uh, migration matters. Uh, instead of using a dummy of whether you have migrated or not. Uh, in an alternate case, they use kilometers moved, which is in terms of log of distance. Um, for those who don't move, for them the distance moved is zero. Uh, so basically, it's log of distance plus one. Uh, and and uh, then also, you find that continuous. In, so this is a continuous variable. So every uh, uh, log kilometer uh, increase in 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 movement. Uh, seems to have a continuous effect. Seems to have a, a positive effect on, on consumption. So, so um, basically, for every percent increase in distance, uh, consumption increases by 0.12 percent. Okay, so, so that's the elasticity of consumption to to kilometers moved. Okay, because it's log on log regression, right? So, so. So this is the that's the interpretation of this, this coefficient. So so it's saying that not only the fact that you moved or not matters, but also how much you have moved. So farther you have moved, it looks like you know your income growth is, is is greater, consumption growth is greater, which which is consistent with the figures, the graphs that I showed before, which showed that you know if, if you compare people non-movers with people who move to nearby village versus to move to some other uh, of, uh, other area within the region versus the moved out of the region, you know, the, the curve shifts farther and farther to the right. This is an instrumental variable regression where the instrument, even when in this specification, you know, they might say that even within households, it could be that you know the, the more motivated individuals, more talented individuals might move. So maybe part of the migration is captured in those individual level specific individual specific heterogeneity. So so that's why what they use is various factors various uh, factors of that that shapes who moves within the household so for example the authors argue that it's systematically the younger people who are more likely to move than older people uh, uh, so so they use all you know a lot of these characteristics uh, to, to predict movement at the first stage and and they use that as an instrument basically for for uh, 
this migration dummy uh, to predict whether uh, they'll move and use that predicted value to, to check whether that predicted migration affects uh, uh, consumption and even then they find very similar results right uh, uh, both for for the dummy as well as for continuous log of uh, distance moment. so this sort of says that you know uh, it, it looks like uh, migration uh, uh, has an independent effect on on uh, consumption so, so migration matters which basically means that not enough people are migrating because if, if there is return positive returns to migration then then you know uh, more people should migrate right at the if you're in equilibrium then then migration should not give you at margin any positive return, right right like in the rural urban when rural urban wage gaps are equalized there is no return to migration okay so so it means that uh, the, the fact that there is return to migration, such a large return to migration, it automatically implies that that not enough people are migrating, right? So, so, so uh, the, we should we should try to understand why why that's happening. Um, here they are checking whether uh, uh, the people who who uh, gain larger number of years in education during this 1992 uh, 1990s to 2004 period those whose education increases larger are those the ones who are systematically moving and and gaining from from migration so so they are in, so they include gains in years of education uh, on log consumption growth and and what they find is that you know this is of course positively correlated with consumption even both for on average across migrants and non-migrants so so you know if you if you gain more education you 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 consumption growth is higher but then they interact this with whether you moved or not and what they find is that is also positive so basically your you know most or most of this positive effect is is driven by by this um, by by the fact that you know they have moved but even then even if you interact with the movement dummy even then the main dummy remains positive and significant what that means is that even those who did not gain so the interpretation of this coefficient is different in column one versus column three its interpretation in column one is that what is the average effect of migration on, on con log consumption growth um, in the petition in column three is that what is the uh, average effect of migration for the people who did not increase any did not gain any years of education during this period so so for them gaining years of education in zero in which case i switch off these two coefficients so so for them uh, so so for those people who did not gain any years in education during this 10 year period even for them there is a return to migration so it's the return to migration cannot be explained by the fact that you know, people people have become more skilled, or, or they, they they gain more education, and 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 hence that's what's driving the uh, uh, the migration return. It is true that some of it is driven by the fact that there is education is increasing for the migrants, uh, but even for people who are not who do not experience increase in education, even for them, migration seems to. Happen. And same is true if you use kilometers more. So if you compare two and four, kilometers moved and kilometers moved times gains in education, that matters, but kilometers moved still independently matters. So so it's not at all education. So so again, even for, for low educated people, it looks like migration seems to give them a benefit. So this is basically saying that you know the farther you move, the greater is your return. So, so if you move to uh, uh, sorry uh, sorry if you move to a more remote area versus a more connected area, the returns are higher. So it's, it's something to do with location. But it is still the case that if you move to a more remote area from where you are living, even then there is a return. So, so it's not all the fact that you are moving to you know a capital city or a more urban area. That's what's drive the return. It is still the case that even if you move to a more remote area, even then you find positive income growth relative to those who stayed there. Even then there is a return to migration, right? 
Uh, and of course, if you move to a more connected area, the return is much higher. It, you know, consumption grows at 66%. But but even even for for those who are moving to a more remote area, the consumption is 17% higher than than those who are remote. Right. So so uh, um, it looks like the fact that you are moving means that you are moving you are moving to a better opportunity. So irrespective of whether you are moving to a city or or to a remote area, whether you are changing occupations or staying in agriculture, uh, whether your e education has gone up or not. Irrespective of the fact, migration per se seems to deliver some, some additional benefits. Okay. Uh, so again, it is saying that you know if you are moving out of agriculture, of course that that has a that has an additional effect on migration. But the original effect remains, right? So if you interact, whether you have moved out of agriculture, uh, 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 even then, you know that of course gives you a higher return. But even then, my main migration uh, matters. Still, still gives you a positive effect. So, so it's so basically they are ruling out all these other explanations. So, so individuals who are higher able. Uh, maybe those, if those are the ones that are moving out, uh, maybe they are also increasing their education. But again, we you know we found that uh, even after controlling for gains in education, even then, even those who did not increase in any years in education, even then they have a positive effect. It cannot be location based. It cannot be occupation based. Uh, so 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 so, or I mean, it cannot. It's not that it cannot be occupation based. The point is that migration, even in absence of all these changes, out of to a, to a better occupation or to a better location, or uh, to to a higher education level, all these have benefits, added benefits to migration. But even if none of these things happen, even then you would still find that migration delivers benefits. Okay, so 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 it's it's something to to to, to do with the fact that there are better opportunities out of out of the out of your current. And, and, and there are money to be made by by moving to to better opportunities. Even if you don't acquire any additional education, if you don't move to a better location, even if you don't move out of the current occupation, even then there are better opportunities uh, uh, for at least for for people living in this region, in Tanzania, and 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 that means that there is lower rate of migration than what it should be, right? So it's so not enough people. Are so that's an evidence that there is some friction in the market, uh, which is sort of hampering people from moving out, right? Because only a few people seem to be moving out and, and uh, getting some benefit, even if they don't have this added other added stuff. Uh, so, 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 so there has to be some friction. And and you know the the the, the authors talk about whether it's it's the um, it's the risk aversion or or. Uh, um, or various other household specific factors that that sort of affect their their uh, movement so here what they're checking is it's trying to predict whether you have moved or not as a function of various uh, individual and household specific factors they it was these factors are initially controlled for in the previous regressions by household fixed effect which sort of compared individuals within households but now they want to understand why people move you know why is it that not everybody uh, are moving to better opportunities even if they are not gaining any additional you know even even if they don't think that they'll get uh, uh, all the benefits but there's still uh, benefits to be reaped even if you move to, to you know there are always better opportunities for everybody you know it doesn't matter whether you're able to move to to a, a, a better better location even if you move to a nearby village and, and you don't move out of agriculture and don't have higher education you, you get better benefits. So there are possibilities of, of making more money, but but people don't seem to be doing it in, in, in enough numbers. Because if they are done so, then we will not found these sort of effects of, of migration alone, right? Um, so so then the question is what 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 pulls people back from from migrating, and and so so in order to test that they they they, they, pr they try to use migration as a dependent variable. Uh, in a probit regression on on a set of factors, what they basically find is that you know their occupation is in farming seems to be an important factor along with 
an area of land cultivated. So basically, the fact that you you have land and you you um, um, you are you are you are working in agriculture seems to be an important determinant of, of whether you stay back or not. Okay. So so basically, what this is saying is that if you are if you are in agriculture and you have more land, you seem to be stuck. It could be that because you face you know, greater risk of appropriation if you have larger land, maybe the land rights are not as well established. So that sort of keeps you grounded at the at the current location. So that sort of uh, that that can be a barrier. So so you know so it's sort of similar to to the land rights papers that was studied where you know if 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 you, if, if, if the state gives you land titles, then it facilitates physical mobility. You know people in living in the, in the slums of Peru, they are more likely to commute to the main city to work. So, so it could you know it could be something like that happening here as well. That people who are working in agriculture and, and have a land, they they seem to not be moved a lot. And it could be because of fear of expropriation. Because land rights are not secure in this area. Right? So so you know so friction in one market meaning in the land market could imply could result in friction in other markets. So, so if you lift the friction in one market, it could lift uh, potentially lift frictions in another market. Okay. So that's that sort of uh, 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 one one takeaway. So so it looks like migration per se does seem to uh, uh, confer economic benefits. So migration leads to economic prosperity even if uh, you do not experience the sort of uh, um, even if you don't move out of your current occupation or even if you don't uh, acquire uh, a higher amount of skill. If you do, migration seems to have greater benefits on of, of acquiring higher education or moving out of agriculture. Um, but 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 there there seems you know money you know, there is there is money to be made if you do move to Right to the right place, and, and not enough people are doing it. So, so and and, and you know, as as the authors argue, there are economic and social environments that affect free flow of labor, reducing the growth prospect of economies because you know it's operating at a large societal level. So, a lot of people who could have gained from moving are not moving. That's why we see in the data that when some people do move, they do experience a gain in moving. Um, um, and and the other factor could be you know this uncertainty. It could be that you know even if you want to move to, to a nearby village, uh, even that involves certain uncertainty, and and you don't want to do that uh, because you know maybe you're living in the subsistence, um, you're living in subsistence, and, and you cannot risk the possibility of starvation. So this specific test was done in a in a, spe a specific paper that that I will not not talk about in detail. But you can read the introduction of this paper by Brian Jodhri and Mubarak. Uh, it's a it's a bus ticket experiment in Bangladesh. So it's looking at seasonal migration from rural to urban areas uh, during lean season when a lot of people face uh, starvation because of uh, uh, you know, not a lot of work is around. Agriculture is not happening, um, and it wants to see no, why not a lot of people move. Uh, not more people move to, to urban areas for in, in search of better jobs uh, during this season. So what they do is it's an RCT. They they go and give random people uh, um, either direct cash or credit contingent on migration, and uh, the cash or the credit amount is enough to cover for the bus fare to and fro to, to the to the city. And what they find is that both this either cash or credit contingent credit intervention leads to substantial increase in not just migration in that period, but remigrate even one to three years after the experiment was done. So, so, so once you push people to migrate, they find better prospects, and then they are more likely to remigrate in, in later in, in the coming years because now they have a local connection in the urban areas and so so you know, they know how to get a job in like this. So these uncertainties, a lot of these uncertainties are resolved when you push people to market, when you ensure that uh, uh, they they um, they they don't have to face starvation because they have enough money to actually you know, go and come back if they don't find work in a few days. Right? 
the prospect of coming. They have enough money for the travel, so so, so they can just try out. So this experimentation uh, cannot happen because they argue, the authors argue, that, that these people are sort of um, living near the subsistence level, so so they don't even have the enough money to, to, to fund this travel because you know then then they'll be sort of you know facing. In case they don't find any work, then this money will be lost, and so so. Uh, uh, they'll they'll be in dire trouble. Um, now, um, what they find is that this experiment resulted in, in substantial increase in consumption expenditure. So, so these people are systematically able to improve their uh, uh, standard of living by just you know funding their their travel only once, and it's a relatively uh, uh, cheap experiment, uh, cheap intervention because it's just you know it's, it's, it's less than ten dollars uh, uh, per per individual. Um, and what they argue that there are other constraints at work, especially great constraints. You know, they could, they cannot borrow this money and, and try this experiment out few times in, until they get lucky. In which case, they are able to pay back. Um, you know, they definitely able to pay back these, these bus fares. But they can't do that because there's great constraint along with risk aversion. So then there are multiple factors operating. So so if it was just credit constraint, then they would have been, they could have probably borrowed from their friends uh, or or. Uh, other households, but but these sort of you know, there are two two factors at work: rate constraint along with risk aversion at work. And they argue that even then, it's not clear why they cannot save up over the years. You know, when they are good monsoons, they could save up money so that you know during rain season they could find migrate and uh, find better jobs. Given that they could do that, so it's it's not obvious why they are not doing it. So so it doesn't explain the full puzzle. Uh, but still, it is the fact they do find that it is the fact that migration seems to seems to conflict benefits, and and there are these barriers uh, in terms of uh, uh, social and economic environments, uh, which sort of shape, which which sort of shape the you know, which which keep the return to migration remain high even in the long run. So you know, this this phenomenon of seasonal migration has been around for a while. Uh, so, so you know, people should have migrated, and, and that should have, would have reduced this return to migration. But, but even that, even today, people find high returns to migration means that you know there's, there's significant barriers to migration, which is keeping the, the, the return to migration high. So, so that sort of is is the, is the idea. You know, then we can think about in the Thursday class what kind of other policies, national level policies, that the government can undertake to to lift these kinds of frictions to help people migrate much more freely uh, which which can have substantial effects on not those individual standard of living but sort of societies in general right because people are moving people will be on mass moving to better opportunities which could have sort of multiplying effect on, on the overall economy so let me stop here and and i'll i'll uh, talk to you on thursday about international